good to be with you all again, uh, both those that are in the auditorium here at Westminster and also those of you that are joining us on Zoom or YouTube. Uh, we've heard a little bit about our Easter program on Good Friday and Easter Sunday and um, we're also hoping uh, that we'll be able to have a great picnic uh, in Victoria Gardens two minutes behind us in groups of six if um, uh, things keep going as, as well as they are doing in um, uh, coming out of lockdown uh, and so just be ready for, for that. Um, during Holy Week, if I can call it that, the week leading up to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, uh, we have decided uh, to call a week of prayer, fasting, and seeking the Lord as the Lord leads you. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening, we will be spending one hour from seven o'clock till eight o'clock uh, praying together with themes, different people presenting. So uh, do be aware of that. That one hour will be incorporated on Tuesday with our Holy Spirit service that is from 7 to 9. So Holy Week, Monday at 7, Tuesday 7 till 9, Wednesday 7 till 8, Thursday 7 till 8. Do join us. Fast and pray as the Lord leads you um, as we are gearing up for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Well, I'm going to do a reading from Joel chapter 3. We have one more uh, sermon on the theme of Joel to come, which he'll be focusing on Joel in the book of Acts. But we have come to the last chapter in the three chapters of the book of Joel. And we have heard Joel chapter 1, this great uh, locust storm that came year after year, uh, across Israel, eating up everything and causing a terrible time to be had by those Israelites who before the locusts had come had been quite careless in their relationship with God. God had been pushed to the peripheries. Um, he wasn't center in their lives. Why should he be? They had everything that they needed. But this plague of locusts that came again and again over a series of years uh, brought them to a place where they were shaken. And that was God's plan to bring them back to himself out of a state of spiritual carelessness. He called them to return to him through the plague of locusts. It seems that if there hadn't been a plague of locusts, these people would have never really have turned to God and that their routine would be one of careless spirituality for their rest of their lives. They didn't realize at the time, but the locusts was a blessing very much in disguise. So they called a fast. They came back to the Lord. And then, as you read in chapter 2, we find that God lifts the locust plague and blesses them in a greater way than they were blessed before the locusts came. As they came out of the locusts, this blessing came, and uh, not only did they have their blessings restored, but now God was at the heart of their lives, not at the periphery, which, of course, was the greatest blessing of all. During it, Joel prophesied, and we heard from Pastor Chua last week, that, that God was planning to pour out his spirit on all flesh, which would be uh, fulfilled uh, in, um, or beginning of the fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. But as we come to chapter 3, we find it shifting a little bit. We've been looking at God's dealing with his people, Israel, their carelessness with him, him allowing a judgment to come, and in that judgment were the seeds of grace and love that would bring them back to him and come into a better place than they were before. But God is also Lord of the nations, and that's the title of my sermon. And in this passage, you see him turning to all the nations. Not only did he judge Israel and then restore them, but he's also the judge and potential restorer of all nations in the world. I'm going to read chapter 3 with you. Joel chapter 3. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you're paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head, and swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. You've sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, in order to remove them far from your border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim among the nations, consecrate for war, stir up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior, hasten and come all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, and their evil is great." Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earthquake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah will flow with water, stream beds, stream beds of Judah will flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Well, I read the whole of this chapter because this is the chapter that people often don't preach on. They preach on the locusts, they preach on the repentance and turning of the people of Israel back to the Lord, and they preach on the Lord restoring them and pouring out his blessing and his spirit. But people tend to forget Joel chapter 3, but Joel chapter 3 is as important to understanding God as the other two chapters. In fact, Joel chapter 3 has come out of that wonderful prophecy about God pouring out his spirit on all flesh and all nations and that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is the God of his people and he deals with his people. He did through the locusts, the call to return and the restoration. But God is also the God of the nations. And just as he can judge his own people and deal with his own people, so God is constantly dealing with the nations of the world. Here at the beginning of the passage, he speaks about restoring the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, and then immediately in verse 2 speaks about gathering the nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat to judge them as a judge. Now, the word Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. And some of you might uh, hear in this and think about, in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Because in that parable, Jesus taught that when he returns with his angels, 
He will call the nations together and he will judge them on, the account, on account of how he treated his people. Those that gave a water to somebody who was thirsty or visited them in prison uh, will get a reward, but those that didn't will be judged and he will separate the nations, the sheep from the goats, deter uh, uh, and that is determined by how they've treated his people. And so there again is a picture of God being Lord and judge of, of the nations. And he is jealous for his people. The way nations treat the church, born again Christians, is not something that God finds uninteresting or not important. But in fact, the way that nations treat God's church, born again people from all denominations, the way that they treat the gospel, the way that they treat the truths of the Bible, God is watching because God judges nations on how they judge his gospel and his people. It's not just this, that, and the other. It is specifically what the New Testament and the Bible teaches and how nations respond to it. God is watching. And then in verse 4, he speaks to Tyre and Sidon. He's dealt with his own people, Israel. They have had the locusts. They've returned to him. They're being restored. And now he sort of moves out a little bit to deal with those nations that are next to Israel, the local contemporary judging of nations. So before we go to the end times, he's saying, I've dealt with Israel. Now, who are the nations next door to Israel? And what are they up to? I'm going to judge them now. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord, but it doesn't stay there. It moves out in concentric circles. So now he's moving out to Tyre and Sidon, on the edges of Israel, on the coastland, where the Philistines historically were. And he says to them, okay, I've been dealing with Israel, but now I'm going to look at you, Tyre and Sidon. And then he says to them, are you paying me back for something in verse 4? In other words, there's this picture of resentment against him by the Philistines and Tyre and Sidon. And God is saying, you got a problem with me? you got a problem with me, Tyre? you got a problem with your sign? You think you're going to pay me back? You're going to teach me and my people a lesson? Oh, don't you worry about my people. I've just dealt with them. And they're coming into a beautiful place, as my plan was. But now I'm turning to you, the neighbors. You've got a problem with me. You've got an issue with me. You're going to sort me out, are you? And then as you read, he says, well, what, what you think you're going to pay me back, how you think you're going to sort me out, and how dare you even think about sorting my chosen people out, well, you are going to receive the payment that you think you're going to extract from me and my people. And we see, what have they been doing? They've been dividing up the land, and they have been trading and enslaving Israelites and selling them for their own gain. Terrible picture, selling of an Israelite child uh, in order to have a prostitute, or selling an Israelite girl as a slave and sending them far away in order to get a barrel of wine. Terrible, terrible things were happening. The exploitation of people is a terrible thing, but God is extremely sensitive and jealous over the exploitation of his own people. He's a jealous God. And there is a difference between, between being one of God's people and not being one of God's people. There is a, a privilege to be invited to be one of God's people. And, and here we see this, his jealousy against these nations and what they have sown, they are going to reap. God is saying, you think you can enslave and divide the land and, and do these terrible things to my people? Well, uh, just as you sow, the reaping will shall come on you and the very terrible things that you have done will visit you again. We should pause because God is, is as active in dealing with the nations today as he was then. 
started with Israel, moved out to the neighbors. We're going to see in a few moments that he moves right out to all the nations of all times. But right now he's local and he's dealing with contemporary issues. That's what he's dealing with. And then he's going to expand these later. How about the nations of the world? How would God speak regarding Great Britain? What would he say? He can speak to Tyre and Sidon. What would he say to the nation of Great Britain? Uh, according to how the nation of Great Britain, both its institutions, but also the majority of people, how they treat him, how they treat his people, and how he treats his truth. What would he say to them? What about the nations of Europe? What about the United States of America? God is speaking and dealing with our contemporary nations today as he is dealing with Tyre and Sidon back there. Abortion is an important issue to God because just as people were being exploited in these days, so the greatest exploitation of human beings in the Western world today is the sacrifice of human beings in the womb. God sees, God notes, and God will, in time, if nothing happens, deal with those nations, those people, and those leaders as surely as he will deal with Tyre and Sidon. What about different nations across the world and the way they treat God's people, God's church, persecuting, dismissing? What about God's word and God's truth thrown in the gutter? Are we, are, is, are nations so progressive that they think that they can leave the Lord behind, that, that truths had so much to do in their past pros, prosperity? Or people so progressive that they can, com, they can progress from the creator and Lord of all, his gospel and the truths embedded in his people. God is at work in the nations today. And he will deal with the resentment against him in certain nations. He will surely deal with them. Then in verse 9, we move from dealing with contemporary nations, having dealt with his own people, contemporary nations and the things that they're up to, which he is doing today. Then he moves and steps back a little bit and he's talking about how he will judge the nations throughout history, there in the contemporary period, but also ongoing right down to the final day of the Lord. And what happens on the final day of the Lord is this. Jesus will return. He will fully judge the nations. But at the same time that Jesus returns to judge and fully judge those that have rejected him, he will also come and rescue and save his people. The day of the Lord, and it's coming soon, is the day of fullness of judgment, but it's also at the same time the day of fullness of salvation. When Jesus returns, all the saints that have gone to glory will be reunited with their bodies, raised from the dead. And those that are around uh, when Jesus returns, who are his people, in a twinkling of an eye, they too will be transformed. And they and those being raised from the dead will greet the Lord in the air as they're raptured and join him as he comes to earth with his full salvation for all who have believed throughout history and his full judgment for all who have rejected him. So, proclaim the nations, consecrate for, for war, verse 9 following. Beat your plowshares into swords and, and pruning ho hooks. Now, what is this? It's, it's speaking about war, political turmoil, and trouble that will proceed throughout history. And this turmoil, this war, this chaos politically, nationally, nation rising against nation, is going to be 
ongoing in various forms. It comes in waves, it recedes, and people say, peace, peace, and then it comes back. And this allowance of the sin of nations to fight amongst one another, war against one another, try and uh, dominate one another, this is in itself the judgment of God to the nations. To allow the sinfulness of sinful nations warring against one another, destroying one another, that is God giving nations over to their own sin. If you want to know how God judges, I won't get into it today, you only need to read Romans chapter 1. That tells you how God normally judges. Three times in Romans chapter 1, it says God gave them over to their sinful mind, their sinful passions. How God normally judges is simply to give people over to their own rebellion. Give people over to their own uh, sinful mindset and godlessness. Almost like saying, if, that's, if you don't want me in your life, that shall be your judgment and I will leave you alone. I remember once early on in my life, uh, I, I said to God, I kept feeling that God was getting in the way, that somehow he was preventing me from doing all the things that I wanted to, which I knew uh, were, were not good things. He was stopping me from sinning. He was getting in the way. He was just, every time I tried to devise something with my friends or whatever, um, I would somehow be restrained in doing it. I remember once, uh, to my shame, I actually directly spoke to God, even though I was an atheist at the time. That's how crazy I was. And I said, leave me alone to do what I wanted to do. And you know what? For a period of time, he did. I got into a, a real mess without God's guarding me and still dealing with some of the consequences of those days in my life today. God partially, thank God he came back, partially gave me over. And so when you see God judging the worlds, the wars, he gives them over to what they want. Now, he can intervene. That's why we're here as priests, a priestly nation. Prayer, nations turning to God can avoid all these things. Isn't that been the story? of Joel chapter 1 and 2, they got locusts year after year. And it was, in a sense, God's judgment. He allowed the locusts to come. He didn't intervene. He didn't stop them. Because although it was terrible judgment, in the midst of every judgment, there is hope, promise, and grace for the future. If people wake up, stop being careless with the Lord, and turn to him, the very judgment which brought them pain will actually deliver them to a place of blessing. He'd done that with his children, Israel, and they'd come to a wonderful place. He'd already said, I'm going to pour my spirit on all nations. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so when we have this stark Joel chapter 3 talking about the contemporary nations, the neighbors of Israel being judged, and then broadening it out prophetically to say, this is the way that history will work. But within that are the seeds that any nation at any time, any church in any nation at any time can stand in the gap for a nation and cause judgment to be lifted, or at least for it to be delayed, or even, if judgment comes, the prayers of the saints can mitigate the judgment. Because we prayed, it won't quite be as bad as it is. The Sodom and Gomorrahs of today need the Abrahams of yesterday to plead with God. Then verse 11, again, bring the nations to Jehoshaphat which I've said means the Lord judges, where I will judge them. It's a picture of a courtroom where these arrogant nations are going to be brought to book. They're going to be brought back into line, but at the right time. Do you know, we talk about sowing to the Spirit, 
and praying and believing God. And that one day, Galatians 6 says, if we don't give up, we'll see a harvest. We keep praying for revival. Sooner or later, uh, God will send his Holy Spirit. We keep believing. We keep sowing. We keep obedience. We shall reap in our lives and those around us the blessing of God. But it works both ways. There is also a sowing to unrighteousness, a sowing to the flesh, a sowing to wickedness, a sowing to rebellion, a, a, sow, a sowing that not immediately, but sooner or later will also bring a harvest that will be reaped. So we find that if we as children of God sow to the Spirit, so to the things of God, sooner or later, and we have to be patient, that's the difficulty, but one day, some harvest of God's blessing, of answered prayer, will come into our experience. But if we as individuals continue to sow to the flesh, to sin, to things that aren't God, to worldliness, maybe not to begin with, Maybe it'll seem fine and good, but sooner or later, that harvest of wickedness will be reaped. And just as it is with the individual, so it is in national life. God deals with people at different levels. He deals firstly with people as individuals. Individuals who can sow to the spirit or sow to the flesh. Individuals. But then he, he also deals with tribes and nations. And so you will not only experience your relationship with God according to you as an individual and how you treat God, but you will also feel the activities and the sowing of reaping of the culture or nation that you live in. You can't help sometimes but have a taste of what's going on in your nation for good or for, or for bad. And so here it says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe in verse 13. Go in, tread for the winepress is full. There's a ripening of the harvest. There's a, a fullness of the vats. And then God says, now is the time. Do you remember in illustration when God said to Abraham, this is the promised land that I shall give to your descendants. But he says, but not yet, because the Amalekites that are already living there, well, the sin of, sorry, the Amorites, the sin of the Amorites who are living in the promised land is not yet at full measure. In other words, God would give the promised land to his people, but at the same time, those that were living in it their wickedness to him would be eventually judged by them being pushed out of the nation. It would be their fault as much as God's promise to the Israelites. And at the time, they weren't wicked enough to be removed from the land. But God foresaw a day when their sowing of wickedness would come to such a, a fullness that it would be time, and God would say, I've waited there's been no repentance, no turning to me. I've waited for hundreds of years, but now the time has come. Put in the sickle, tread the grapes. The Amorites are ripe for judgment. And finally, in this last section, in verse 16, it says, with all this final judgment and God working judgment in comp contemporary nations and working through history, there's a refuge and a stronghold for God's people to be in. Whatever levels of judgment that occur at different times, there's always an ark for God's people and everybody who wants to run into. That's why uh, I will pour out my spirit on all people and whoever calls on the name will be saved. And then you've got this beautiful picture of God having dealt with the nations on that day and then dealing with them, having judged them, there is now a beautiful uh, restoration 
where God will be with his people forever. So in summary, we have found that in Joel, God has dealt with his wayward people and they have returned to him and such beautiful promises of blessing in his presence. But now in chapter 3, we see that God also turns to the nations. And again, he wants the nations to come to him. Didn't, don't we see on the day of Pentecost that as soon as the Holy Spirit fills the disciples in the upper room, they come out speaking in other tongues that is heard by people each in their own language. So what God did with Israel, allowing the locusts to come, calling them to him, then saving and blessing them, that is the model for what God wants in the whole world. He wants all nations to turn to him as Israel did. This coronavirus, whatever else it is, it is a call from God to the nations of the world to return to him and his ways so that he can then bless them and save them. And out of every nation, tribe, and tongue, God is saving today. This is a template for you to understand the big scheme <coughs> of things and the big scheme of what God is doing in history. And pray that God will have mercy on our nations and that we will be able to turn judgment into revival, cursing into blessing, and that God will once again have mercy on the nations and on ourselves. Father, we thank you for the book of Joel, a template for understanding the shaking of the nations today. We think of ourselves, Lord, and how you've been dealing with us. We think of our nation, Lord, and ask for mercy on it, for it is, by and large, a godless nation. But thank you, you have left a remnant, a strong remnant in our nation to plead and to pray and to bring mercy and not judgment. We think of all the nations that mean things to us personally, and we lift them to you. And we say, Lord, we weep from the altar to the porch, the porch where we see the nations struggle, and the altar where mercy can be obtained through pray prayer and faith for those that are in the world. Lord, the only hope of the nations is you, but also the intercession witness of your priests on earth, every born-again believer. Help us, Lord, not only to return to you for our own blessing, but help us, Lord, to turn the nations to you for your glory before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.